I've been in a room where people have done the interactive, close your eyes, think of an entrepreneur, and who do you see, right? And everyone sees someone that looks like Zuckerberg. I think that's some of the challenges that has kind of uh, created this um, this disconnect, this crisis that we have around um, students of color pursuing STEM jobs, STEM roles. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they die. This is where we come to win, we come to fly. This is where we make our dreams come to life. Welcome to Innovation City. Welcome to Innovation City, a podcast featuring the innovators, disruptors, and creators who are making things happen. My name is Michael T. Johnson, and I'm here, as always, with my co-host, Tyler Kelly. Today, we're at Venture Cafe Miami, Venture Cafe being the largest gathering of innovators in the entire world on a Thursday evening. So go check it out. If that sounds interesting to you, uh, you're going to love it. So today, we have a very special guest, Carlos Vazquez. Carlos, thanks for being here with us today. Absolutely. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So Carlos is the president and CEO of Miami EdTech, a nonprofit that provides professional development to teachers and helps them integrate computer science, computational thinking, and entrepreneurism into the core content areas like math and science. Carlos is a former teacher. And because of that experience, and then your experience just right. growing up as a kid in the schools in New York City, right. you, you've committed to really empowering educators and helping them ignite a passion in STEM for their students. And you do this through a pretty unique combination of positive psychology and social justice to address the striking inequities in access and training and education, especially for people of color. So right. it's going to be an amazing conversation. Yeah, I'm excited. Happy to have you on the show. Thank you. Awesome. Happy to be here. So education, so obviously you wouldn't be a teacher or you wouldn't be in education if you didn't have a passion for education. Right. So tell me about where that came from, how you got your start. Totally. Um, so yeah, as uh, Tyler mentioned, just being a student in the New York City public school system and just having really great experiences with teachers and getting lucky, lucky, lucky along the way and meeting the right people who would take me under their wing and kind of went out their way to show me things that I didn't or wouldn't normally get exposed to um, growing up in the South Bronx, basically. So, you know, I'm a first generation graduate, um, first in my family to even go to college. And um, it was something that uh, for me, I, I wouldn't say I took it for granted, but I didn't think about myself contributing to the education landscape. I was benefiting from it and I thought I was on a path um, specifically in computer science, mostly because it sounded really cool back then, and I thought I could make a lot of money. Um, so when I when I graduated college and you know landed a, a good job and worked in the corporate space for a little while, I still felt pretty empty. I, st- I started to feel like um, I didn't, I wasn't truly filling my own bucket, you know. Um, and one of the moments that I had that really had me reflect. Um, about my career and where I was going was when I actually had saved up enough money to uh, to buy my mom a house. Um, it was like a goal that I always had, and uh, and I remember telling her about it, and she uh, she actually said she didn't want to move. So <laughs> it was one of those moments in life where you're like, wait, I've been working on this this whole time, and and you don't want to move. Uh, and she shared why, and there were a lot of reasons, just kind of like tied to her and being a part of the community she was in. And, you know, we grew up in the project, so it was like really tightly knit. Um, and, you know, people, as I come to learn, deal with uh, imposter syndrome. And I think at the time my mom was like, didn't know what it would mean to like have a house, you know, pay a mortgage and do all of that stuff. So, but um, I share that story because it was such a critical part of my transition into education full time. Cause I had done it, I did tutoring, I did stuff in college. But at that point, um, she basically was like, Use that money, pay what you need to pay, and do something for yourself. And that's what I did, I, I became a teacher. So I paid off a little bit of debt that I had with some of that money, and um, and basically restarted my career. And so you've taught in New York, San Fran, right. Miami. Yep, places I've traveled, I guess. Okay, okay. <laughs> when I can't stop talking. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I started teaching in New York City. Um, I went to Fordham University, uh, worked in like a STEM program there. Um, it's funny because at the time uh, I saw these different worlds like I saw tech and and just kind of like people and 
it was like separate, right? And and then, um, you know, even then it wasn't really separate. It was more like you were there were um, there was an audience. There was a group of people that dominated, you know, the computer science and coding world. So a lot of the students that we work with they didn't really see themselves in those roles. The same way, probably, um, you know, similarly with entrepreneurship. If you like. You know, and I've been in a room where people have done the interactive, close your eyes, think of an entrepreneur, and who do you see, right? And everyone sees someone that looks like Zuckerberg. I think that's some of the challenges that has kind of uh, created this, um, this disconnect, this, this, you know, this crisis that we have around um, students of color pursuing STEM jobs, STEM roles. And, uh, and for me, when, when I decided to go full time, I didn't really think it would be in the computer science space because I didn't really think I belonged in that space. I didn't see anyone like me in the space, so I kind of felt like an outsider. Um, and even now, I still go to conferences, and you know, I'm way more confident now, but there's still like imposter syndrome that you feel when you're trying to teach a traditional topic in ways that are different than like the norm. Now, is that the same in New York, in all, all the places where you've been? Is it yeah. same struggles, same challenges? Yeah, I mean, um, that's funny. I've been really reflecting on that lately because uh, we were just at, so Miami at Tech, we recently got selected to be a part of a of a cohort um, for an, ex- an organization called CS for All. And what they've created is a new, is a, it's a pilot cohort of 10 different regions in the country called Ecosystems for CS. So um, like 80 cities applied and the idea is that they bring these um, kind of like regional leaders together to see if they can create um, a larger movement in their respective cities, right? So, in being there and hearing from cities like, you know, in Chicago and Washington and Virginia and like seeing what everyone else is doing, it kind of helps you figure out like where you are, right? So, um, lately, and I've been now here in Miami for almost 10 years basically. Um, you know, we've come a long way. We've got a lot of work to do, but it was reassuring to hear where everyone goes through that, you know, the, the struggle of figuring out. Um, how to implement uh, or, or improve the STEM crisis, because it really is a crisis across the country. The one thing that's unique about Miami is that um, our teachers reflect the demographic of our students, which is not common. 85% of teachers in the United States are white. Um, the average age is like 45 and female. So in Miami, we have close to 85% being black and you know Latinx. So there's a big contrast with the rest of the country. And for me, that's kind of a call to action because those teachers probably didn't get access or exposure to STEM in their own lives. And now here they are responsible for doing that for their students. So I think that's the unique thing about Miami that we have as an advantage, but it also shows that um, we need a lot of support and resources. So that's kind of like where I've dedicated the work is to helping teachers who are really gonna be the main source of um, influence uh, at, 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 in their schools for students who, like me, didn't have access to that outside of the classroom. So it's, it's that issue exactly that, that led you to start Miami Ed Tech. Yeah, I mean, I started it, I kind of like stumbled into a nonprofit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just like barreling in, oh, I have a nonprofit. But um, it, the goal was community. It was how do we make collective impact? How do we get people together who are also passionate? Because in the startup space, you can kind of get caught in the weeds in your own mission and forget to kind of look up and see who's around you. So when I started Miami Ed Tech, the idea was to be like, you are solving problems in education and you're doing that and you want to sit, let's come together and say, hey, there is a movement of people out to make a change in education. And that's really what it was supposed to be. It was a meetup on steroids. And then that led into an accelerator because people were like, hey, can we apply some structure, startup structure and principles to you know, accelerating our educational impact? And, uh, and that's what we did. We put together an accelerator and it was made up of a couple of teachers, a couple of startups here locally. And then we had two companies that were from Eastern Europe looking to kind of like find a way into the U.S. education market. And then we had um, probably my two favorite in the cohort. I um, shouldn't talk about favorites, but two grandmothers, really, because they were there to help solve challenges that they were facing as grandparents because they are super talented. But the particular angle that they had was as a grandparent. One in particular, she wanted to 
um, solve the problem of the way we we kind of check in kids into daycare. So she picks up her grandkid and notice that it's just like a bunch of notebooks and you know paper kind of strewn together, and you sign in and sign out. And she said, "There's got to be a better way." So because a lot of times when we when we talk about ed tech, people immediately immediately think of like the K through 12 classroom and forget that learning happens you know everywhere, every stage of life. I mean, we should always be learning. And in that particular um, scenario just kind of guiding her she she was about to retire from the county so she was like hopefully hopefully looking for that next phase of, of her of her career and um, she did the accelerator went on to create a prototype of the product and everyone just kind of you know just to have that energy of everyone working towards solving these educational challenges and bouncing ideas off of each other it was like an awesome experience and it was after that that I realized okay we have something here you you mentioned a, a problem that I hear people talk a lot about, and that's there's a bunch of people that are really passionate about solving a problem. You've all got your heads down <laughs> trying to solve it. Right. And I, I hear this like with almost an itty city or anything to talk about, <laughs> and I can think of like two dozen people trying to solve the same problem. Right. And uh, this may be like a two-part question, but is an accelerator an answer to getting all those people to work together? Or like how do you get all those people working together on the same problem? Yeah, I think... Um for us, like we were under that umbrella of like education technology and redefining education and insert your like, you know, disruptive way of, of doing it. And, um, you know, I don't think that, I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we kind of pause to see who's around us working towards that problem. Because even though like you might be under the umbrella of the problem, there's still gonna be like specific um, verticals under that problem. But the more voices you get together advocating for awareness, I think it just helps everyone in the ecosystem, especially for us in education, right? So like here I am advocating for teachers and really fighting for um, better training, better support, better resources. And yet the probably the most important thing really is better pay for teachers and policy related things. But if we start to create noise around the overall support of teachers, it can create the momentum needed to drive policy changes and um, other major, you know, shifts or improvements. So, I, I, it's true. Like I see that in the different cities. The unique thing about Miami for me is that it's it's a uh, it's small enough where it's not um, impossible to get key stakeholders, decision makers into a room to share what you're working on. Other cities like in New York and San Francisco to get a mayor in the room to kind of listen and see if they can assign someone to help you is practically impossible. And that's one of the things I learned fast about Miami and it was, really has kind of you know been a big reason why I'm, why I'm still here. So tell me what does uh, positive psychology and social justice have to do with STEM? Yeah, so access and opportunity, right? So like, um, we talk a lot about soft skills versus hard skills, soft skills being more of the mindset related you know, qualities. And when you speak to employers who are hiring, they often talk about soft skills, critical thinking, problem solving, communication, collaboration. And, um, and they'll say hard skills, we can teach you Excel, we can teach you how to use Word, we can teach you Salesforce, but how, how do we teach someone to be a go-getter? And really what we wanna do is create environments where students feel agency over their decisions and also feel um, like they like it's a real opportunity because I think what winds up happening is students feel like the, the world of Facebook and other startups just feel so disconnected from their realities they don't know anyone that works at a startup right unfortunately so maybe now they do because it's starting to get obviously more common but so how do you make that more real how do you convince a student or cultivate uh, an environment where a student feels in control of their outcome and that they can actually work towards doing something that they might not know, you know, someone who does. So for me, I've been studying positive psychology and, and that the impact of, of being, of creating that environment. And you're seeing like it's making a difference. Yeah, I mean, I think even, you know, for adult learners, right? So I teach at Miami Day College and, um, you know, I think there's a there's a saying that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but it's not true. You actually can, right? You have to be patient enough and have to kind of show why it's important to learn something. And you know, I've seen it with some of the students, the older students in my classroom. You know, my approach is not like you're gonna do it, do it now, get it right. You know, it's more like you know, this is why you should do it. This is how it can help you. Um, and when you create that environment, it just feels safer to make a mistake. It feels safer to to ask a question. And, and that's what I've 
created. So I I don't want to separate the learning of the tech from the cultivation of the you know of that positive learning environment. And you mentioned that you know sometimes it just takes seeing somebody like me who has done something that I didn't think I could do yeah. in order to kind of get over that mental you know hurdle of seeing myself down the line, right? Right, totally. Talk, talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I have statistics fresh in my mind because I'm constantly applying for opportunities, right, the, the startup hustle, but um, 9% and 7% of STEM, of STEM workers are black and Latinx, right? So 16% more or less, which doesn't actually represent the, the statistics of, uh, that, of the population, right? Um, that's representative of that. So what is happening? They're not seeing role models who can kind of uh, inspire them to do it. Because um, if, if they were, it would feel, as we were just saying, more real. And if, if you see a potential, if you see someone who's kind of made it to the finish line, you're like, oh, okay, if I run that race, I can, I can make it there. So for us, what I try to do and, and I mentioned the demographic of teachers here in Miami, 85% are black and Latinx, which is completely different in the rest of the world, um, the rest of the country. Um, if we can get them to be excited about technology again, you know, be uh, curious, right? And genuinely enjoy uh, the, what we wind up doing is we teach coding, but we forget to teach the pieces before that, the problem solving. Like you code to solve a problem. You don't just go into a computer and start hacking away. You gotta think about is this a problem? Is this a problem worth solving? And there's all those things that we talk about that we kind of forget to show teachers when we talk to them about coding. So that's what the, the incubator that we have does. We have an incubator that takes them through that journey and then they actually build a prototype. They build an app that looks like it was coded, but it was just kind of like drag and drop screens, right? Because eventually we're already at a place where coding is... Uh, you know, getting less and less. AI is starting to replace that. You can just, you know, use tools to create an app. So how do we empower teachers on the front lines of those problems to, to create solutions at scale and actually enjoy the process? So what, so talk to me about, you know, your biggest challenge in the, mm -hmm. in the short term for Miami EdTech and yeah. how can the, the community, you know, gather, you know, rally around and help? You know, it's interesting. So Miami-Dade County Public Schools is the fourth largest district in the country. Um, we have a lot of teachers. We have a lot of students, a lot of schools who need access to um, volunteers, people who maybe work in STEM and can just kind of spend an hour at a school. I mean, the difference that'll make of just if you, you know, work in a, uh, in a, in a STEM role um, or even at a startup and you can go in and talk to a classroom of students who are just like so eager to hear what it is in the outside world, right? Um, right now we have, uh, so Computer Science Week is from December 9th to the 15th. And we have almost 60 teachers that have asked for us to help them with providing some folks to go in and speak um, to their students or to show them a new tool or just answer some questions about what they do day to day. So I think we've kind of gotten away from that, like trying to find ways to get more involved with schools. We get caught up in our lives. Like me as a parent now, like a new parent of a three-year-old, um, we just went and, and read it to his, to his classmates, right? And it was so awesome just being there and having them see a different um, perspective and, a, and have a different experience. So I think, yeah, long story short, is like let's, let's get more involved with our schools and see how we can step up and, and volunteer and do stuff. What kind of stuff like uh, success stories or what are, you, what are you celebrating? Wow, yeah, we have had a really good year um, and because we've just, the people who we've, we've empowered and who have gone through our programming have starting to see the results of like their efforts, you know? And um, for example, we have uh, a former cohort participant, Samantha Pratt, who uh, went through our program. Um, she's a middle, she was a middle school teacher through Teach for America. And she um, wanted to build an app to help middle school students really kind of like process their emotions, deal with anxiety, find ways to self-regulate and empower themselves. So she built an app called Click Engage. And through this app, which is by the way now in the app store, um, I mean, the scale, the magnitude of who she can reach with that, being that she was on the front lines, well, she went ahead and she became a Camelback Venture, she got another opportunity with NPR, um, so that's one story. There's a couple other stories, but for us as an, as an organization, our biggest win was getting a, a grant from Microsoft to support our computer science training. So anytime your mission just aligns with, you know, the philanthropic side and social corporate responsibility, um, 
it's a game changer for so that took us to a place where you know we can breathe we can kind of be more strategic about how we execute uh, and then I think I mentioned uh, being a part of the cohort now. So, you know, Microsoft really helped us um, put our feet on the ground as to what we're, as to the problem we're trying to solve locally. And being a part of this cohort with cs for all is now going to give us a, a unique perspective when it's being informed by all the cities around us. So it creates an opportunity to learn faster and implement faster. So you've gone from, in kind of like your story you've told us today. Mm -hmm. So you were, you're in computer science. You basically like reinvented yourself, right? <laughs> became a teacher, yeah. and then reinvented yourself once again. Became like an entrepreneur in the startup nonprofit space, right? What kind of advice, or from that from that journey, what have you learned that you feel like you could share with somebody who wants to make a difference in whatever space they're in? Um, great question. I think um, so. Lately, I've been on a, a journey of meditation. I've actually been meditating over the past year. And it's really allowed for me to reflect and kind of take a step back. And, and we talked about it when we just first started around just when you're in the weeds and you're constantly attacking and doing things, you don't just kind of look up and say, okay, what is this? Why am I doing this again? How does this fit into like my big goal, my passion? Because you can get caught up in doing things that, you know, you might not be as passionate about, but you just, you're just in the motion and you're just doing it. Next thing you know, you're in a, in a place where, it's kind of like, why am I here again? So I think taking the time to pause, reflect, look back, be strategic, um, have that notebook out, you know, look at today, but look at tomorrow and look at next week too. Um, I mean, I guess that's something that you can do when you kind of, uh, when you are able to get resources and funding, which is also really critical in the startup space. Um, but even in the beginning, so that you don't start to veer off track from what you're actually passionate about, it's important to spend that time reflecting. That's awesome. Carlos, thank you for being on the show. How can people get in touch with you, with the organization, all, all of the goods, social, web? Absolutely. All of, the above. All of it pretty, is Miami Ed Tech. You know, check out our site, read our blog. We have some cool articles there and feature some of our teachers. Um, and on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, Miami Ed Tech. Awesome. 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 Thank, thank you, Carlos. Thanks for being on the Appreciate show. Appreciate it, of course. Thanks. For more episodes, visit innovationcity.co. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And if you're in Miami, visit us on Thursday nights. Details are at VentureCafeMiami.org. And be sure to connect with us on social at We Are Slam and at Venture Cafe MIA. Thanks for listening. This is where it all begins, so say goodbye to all your fears, all your doubts. This is where they